Hello everyone and welcome to the Geek Narrator podcast. I am back with another episode and today we are going to talk about data processing. We are going to compare batch and real time streaming solutions and how they work, what are the challenges, what are the things to keep in mind when we are talking about these two systems. And most importantly, what are the tools available for you when you're thinking about data processing at a large scale, you're working with a large amounts of data that is coming in at high pace and you have to make some critical decisions for your business. So how do you go about that? Today's episode is brought to you by Estuary, the game changer in data movement and transformation. With Estuary, you can build free streaming pipelines and create real-time transformations, providing a consistent, exact copy of your data precisely where you need it. That too, all in real time. Estuary is all-in-one tool designed for your entire team Built on a proven fault-tolerant architecture, Estuary ensures reliability and extreme scalability. The best part? You can start using Estuary for free. Whether you're an architect, engineer, or analyst, Estuary is built for you. Estuary, our sponsor for today, puts your data where you want it in milliseconds. Now enjoy the episode. Today I have Phil with me from Estuary, and he has vast background in, in these kind of systems, and he's going to talk to us about batch processing and real-time stream processing and how do they compare and different challenges with real-world examples. So with this, let's welcome our guest for today. Phil, welcome to the show. I'm really excited to have you. Let's start with a little bit of introduction for our viewers about yourself, about what you're currently doing and about Estuary. Sure. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. My name is Phil Freed and I've been working here at Estuary since just about the beginning. Estuary is just a really cool product, a cool piece of software that is honestly something that I've been wanting to build for a long time before even Johnny first reached out to me. And it is a real-time data ops platform, which is maybe to break through the buzzwords a little bit, the, the real point of it is that it can get your data wherever you want it. Mm -hmm. So. If you have data in an operational database over here and you want it in an analytics database over there, that's obviously a very common use case. That's the kind of thing that we do all the time. And we do it in real time. Mm -hmm. So Flow is the name of our product and it is a streaming system. Mm -hmm. The genesis for that was really that from my background, I'd previously worked in other companies doing ETL focused products and things like that. And typically those things have been using these kind of batch paradigms. And so for me, this has been really cool because I've gotten to, to see how ETL is done and how it works at scale under the hood with batch systems, several different batch systems and now going on to streaming. And so that yeah, I'm really excited to share about that. Absolutely. We want to start really basic here for our viewers just to give them some context, right? Like when we say batch and real time, I know you call it complete and incremental processing. So we'll talk about that as well, but let's define. So we know that, okay, if there is a lot of data, we want to process in a batch, like in a collection of data, right? That's called batch processing. And then the real time aspect is like you process as and when the data is coming. But let's define what is the core concept behind these batch and real time systems? Yeah, that's a, I think a great place to start because it's perhaps more, more nuanced than people really expect. So I think if you talk about like the, maybe some sort of formal definition of batch processing, which is probably pretty fraught and you might get a bunch of people correcting me here, but. Really the basic thing is that in a batch process, you have a, a source for your data mm -hmm. and a destination. And that is true of any data processing task that yeah. we do. And with a batch job, the source needs to accumulate data over time, for example. So say you have an operational database and just for example, this is maybe a web app where you have a user's table mm -hmm. and as users sign up for your application, we add entries to there. And the whole idea of a batch job 
is that web app is accumulating those users over time. And so you have access to the both historical users who have signed up and maybe a user who signed up just a few milliseconds before your job runs. And those are all available to you in that table. And the, a good example you know, or illustrative example of a batch job is that you're going to take all of the data from that source. You might do some transformation along the way, but you're going to copy then all of it to the destination. Yeah. And I, I think that's a good baseline place to start when you're talking about a batch job in practice, that tends to not really work very well, especially as the user's table grows, right? So if, if we're talking about a very small web app with a couple dozen users and maybe you get a few signups per week, that's great. The naive thing of just saying, take all the data from the source and copy it all to the destination. You can be totally fine. Yeah. Obviously where that stops working well is when you have a great number of entries in that table or a great number of updates to it over time. Mm -hmm. And that's where it starts to, to become very costly, right? I, I think a lot of people where they start to, to become curious about streaming is they say, okay, this is becoming very costly. And it's causing us to run our jobs less frequently, right? So now we're spending more money and we're really delivering less value hmm. when we're maybe running our job weekly now because it's really expensive and it takes two hours or what have you. Streaming is oftentimes considered an answer for that. And that's one sort of entry point into the streaming ecosystem. Of course, people will be quick to point out though, that that's that naive approach to batch processing is not what a lot of people do. And a lot of people use batch tools, even at scale, and they use them effectively and they manage to, to keep their costs within reason. There's trade-offs there. And mm -hmm. just like anything else in computers and engineering, there's always trade-offs mm -hmm. at a high level. I would say that it's really to break down the problem as I look at it as the breakdown would be in really two main places. One is if I want to make this cheaper, then I really want to be able to incrementally identify new data that I want to act on, right? So here's our naive batch job, just a very simple user's table. We copy the whole thing, of course. In reality, this simple batch job is really many batch jobs, right? You're, you're going to have additional users that sign up over time and you want to get those all say to your data warehouse or whatever the destination is for you. Yeah. So one aspect of this is now, okay, so we've had a few users added to our, how can we make it so that we don't have to recopy all of the historical data mm -hmm. and we really just want to sync the new data. Hmm. And this is really where, where, how, or this is a good illustration of why I like to talk about this in terms of incremental versus non-incremental processing. Yeah. I, I think if we're just going back to the, the basic question of defining batch versus streaming, I think when we talk about streaming, there's really two aspects to it. One is that it's incremental. And that I think is honestly the more important factor to most people. Yeah. That's where you get your cost savings and things like that. The other is that it tends to be real time. Flow is a real time streaming platform. You can do streaming that isn't real time. Mm -hmm. You can do batch that is incremental. So. Back to incremental, and this is part of why where batch starts to get complicated is you want to do, you want to do incremental processing like this. And one common strategy is you're going to do something like this, right? Where you, you add an updated at column to your database yeah. and now your batch job can do something like this SQL query over here, where you're really just 
looking for data that has been updated or modified since the last time you have synced it. This is super common and it'll actually can work pretty well in a lot of scenarios. There are some trade-offs though, and probably the biggest, most obvious thing is that you have to go add this update to that column to your database everywhere. And yeah. every source that you want to treat incrementally has to have some sort of capability to do this. You've got some considerations there are like, in this example, we're talking about a web app. Maybe you just have a Postgres database, probably pretty easy to add an updated at column for most yeah. of those things. If you want to be fancy, you could even have a trigger that updates it automatically or your application maybe doesn't have to be quite as impacted. Conceptually, you're still on the hook to really put this complexity into your source systems, right? So it's not part of your data pipelines anymore. It's also in your source systems. Some of the other trade-offs here are, okay, when we talk about orchestrating these jobs, when we're orchestrating these batch jobs, that, that last sync time is state and it's state that we have to really manage now in order for our jobs to run co correctly, yeah. right? If we're going back here, we have a job that's going to run and just get the users from the last sync time. What is that last sync time? That's one bit. The other bit is that not every application is capable of being instrumented in this way, right? It's, there are certain sources that just, you know, it's going to be really hard to do it, do something like this. A good example might be something like click stream data or, you know, webhooks that are coming in. You, you may not have the ability to do this for everything. Yeah. And that's where streaming becomes really nice because you then, you don't have to have any kind of special process, right? So again, going back to that really basic definition of batch, right? It's when your source is accumulating the data and then you have a job that just reads it all. The source can't always accumulate that data. And sometimes we end up doing things that less than ideal, right? Like we, we might have to build in accumulation of that into our pipeline somehow. So it can get pretty messy. The orchestration of that is, is again, that's also a, a kind of an additional dimension to the problem. And, and in particular, the orchestration to me is a problem because when that orchestration you know, when all, you have all these batch jobs, they're actually stateful yeah. because they need at a bare minimum, like a last sync time or, or something mm -hmm. like that. But you're never really looking at these things in isolation, right? So this is the kind of the danger in, in maybe overly simple examples, right? If we're looking at one batch job, that's just copying data from one source to one destination, that problem of state, it's just a last sync time. Come on. How hard is yeah. that? In reality, for most of us, we're not just dealing with one source and one destination. We're dealing with a lot of times a great many sources and oftentimes more than one destination as well to muddy the waters even farther. In reality, there's also this desire to say, okay, we actually want to do some aggregation before we even land the data. Right. This is a common thing when we're talking about business decisions that rely on large aggregates of data. One thing that you could do is to say, you know what, we're just going to copy all the data into the data warehouse and let everything else happen there. And, and this is, it's a common thing that's really pushed by ELT vendors. Yeah. And I think that it is. Something that can work for some people, it also has a lot of downsides, right? So there's a lot of reasons why it can be better to really do some aggregation before landing that data in your, whatever that, that kind of final destination is for you. Yep. And that adds in a lot more complexity, right? Because now you have this kind of graph of jobs that all depend on each other 
So you've got dependencies between jobs. You've got jobs that sometimes even depend on the data from your data warehouse so that they can do things incrementally and still produce meaningful aggregates. And in all of this, your, your failure scenarios are sometimes quite complicated, right? So what is your last sync time when just one of these jobs has failed? These are, are things that have answers and they're answers that are always just, they tend to be a little bit unsatisfying and come with other trade-offs. For example, you can do it incrementally as long as you have an updated column, but for systems that don't have an updated column, you've got to do something else. Yeah. Then cool. you've got to figure out how to marry those two different systems together and make them work correctly. The way I see it, streaming, at least conceptually, can simplify. So the, the, a big difference with a streaming system, just right off, right out of the gate, is that your jobs don't run sequentially many times over time. It's conceptually a long running thing. I, I might have a stateful job here that is really, it's running continuously and continuously reading data from the source. And so that's, that can be nice in terms of it's both incremental in that it's maintaining its own state and it is only copying over things that have been updated since the last time that it has looked, but it's also then low latency, right? It's because it's essentially doing the same thing. You might as well keep it running. If you have a system that's updating very frequently and so you're removing a dimension from this, uh, this graph of jobs and each of these jobs is able to read from the other until you get your final set of data products that you want to push out. And, and again, that pushing out can also be incremental. That's really what our focus has been on with flow is we're really not trying to reinvent the wheel when it comes to streaming. But what we are trying to do is take these existing paradigms that, that work for basically we're trying to take something that is in reality, very complicated, which is managing each of these stateful jobs and taking care of all the other problems that kind of come along with them and making it conceptually simple in a very similar way that say something like, like airflow has done for a batch process where in, in a, you know, an airflow DAG, for example, if your if one of your jobs fails, then airflow could know about it and do the right thing. It gives you some consistent best practices for error handling, monitoring the status and things like that. And that's a lot of what we're trying to do with our platform is really take this and make it similarly very simple, consistent, easy to work with. I think this makes sense. And even I have done something similar, as you mentioned, like the last sync date and the updated at column and trying to do incremental processing with the batch paradigm. It works, but it has some challenges. And if it works for you, it's good enough, but that's probably not the best way to do it. That's what we want to say here. And the thing that I liked about not implementing incremental processing using the batch paradigm is that it it is not even consistent. So some tables might have updated at, some tables might call it differently. Some table might never get updated. These are just like append only table, for example, right? Mm -hmm. So in all that cases, the implementation differs slightly. And then you have to do all these like little hacks and tricks everywhere in your pipeline, which makes it really complicated. So yeah, it's a solution, but it's not the best solution is what we want to emphasize on. And there is, there's definitely some side effects that come along the way. As you mentioned, that we have to process a lot of data that we maybe don't need to, depending on the type of task we are trying to do. And then when this job gets complicated, there's a lot of relations happening and the orchestration itself becomes challenging. And mainly when things fail. Just to give an example, I worked at a company where there was like 
many jobs linked to each other and then the you know some of them would fail and then fail in a bad state and then we have to sometimes figure out because bugs happen right like we might make some changes and there are some jobs in middle of the dag which failed and corrupted the state and then we have to do the reprocessing i'm sure that also happens somewhere in streaming world but that is big of a pain in batch because there's a ton of data that you have not processed i'm specifically curious about so we said that when we adopt a streaming solution we are processing data as it is coming in more frequently so the latency is very low so i want to compare these two paradigms on latency and throughput so when mm-hmm. we say that we are doing bulk processing we are taking a lot of data and processing and let's say that processing itself is fast enough we we can process a lot of data in short amount of time maybe for the first record that came in the latency would be higher than expected but we are still processing a large amount of data but when we talk about streaming for the first one that come it might be very quickly but how does it compare throughput wise yeah that's a really good question and i think it's really interesting especially because of the history of analytics here i think is very much a factor yeah right? if we go back far enough just about everything was a batch job and and just about all of analytics was an afterthought right like mm. we we realized oh we have all this this very juicy data that sounds very valuable and let's get it over there and certainly you know the first systems that i worked on were literally just a job that takes a bunch of data and exports an excel sheet mm. and when you think about starting there which i think really is it, it's maybe a silly example but i think it's actually very important because a lot of businesses really do start there they're mm-hmm. going to they're going to look at their data and they're going to say hey let's get some value out of this what is the simplest thing we can do yeah and it's usually going to start with something like a batch job where they say okay i've got the data out now i can do something interesting with it and so i think very naturally you know what we do is we try to scale that yeah. right and and i think the efforts there have been truly Im- impressive i i worked with years ago things like hadoop in hdfs and spark before before spark streaming really and the throughput of those systems is absolutely incredible but yeah you've got a, a job that can take all of your 3 billion rows and distribute the work amongst an incredible number of worker nodes that are all able to process this stuff in parallel and efficiently bring back the results and now you've got a query that's processing over many billions of rows yeah. and all of a sudden you're getting insight from that query you're getting your aggregate in, in just seconds and from that perspective there's simply it's difficult to beat the throughput of a system like that when you're talking about it in those terms right you yeah. have all of the data that is typically you're setting yourself up for that kind of scenario by bringing the data close to where you're going to do the processing right this is the the big idea with hadoop and hdfs and that kind of stuff you're bringing the data close to where you want to do the processing and now you can just really churn through it really fast so that's great but again it's really the same problem where if i'm going to do something like a a hive query where I'm, which is essentially for those who don't know it's essentially translating this sql query into hadoop map produce jobs yeah that that are going to do the data processing and i can do that i can it can execute very quickly but every time i run that query it's going to reprocess all that data and my the answer that i want as defined by that sql query is not going to be updated incrementally mm-hmm. and and i think that an important call out here is that's really where everything starts right so when we talk about getting insights out of data we typically don't know exactly what we want there's a need and an important need for this kind of like exploratory queries and ad hoc 
queries and figuring out what's there, what do I want? And, and it's really useful in that scenario to just have a, a data warehouse or something that's able to work in, again, there's conceptually, there's not much difference between the, the old hive query example and something like snowflake or big query. Yeah. But the tricky part is that we have a, a generally a, a desire to take some of those aggregates and move them from the very last stage, move them out of your data warehouse and try to perform some of that aggregation upstream and ideally incrementally. And that's primarily, it's a cost saving thing, right? We know what we want. Why reprocess all 3 billion rows every time we want the answer to this, if we're able to keep a running average, getting back to the basic question, comparing the throughput of these systems, I would say that there, there really is no difference in, in terms of raw throughput, although to be sure, if you're talking about doing some aggregates and stuff, batch systems have a lot of tricks up their sleeves for making that faster, processing data in big chunks and things like that. There's a lot of optimizations that are available if you know all the, about a lot about the data before you're trying to query it, that you're not really able to take advantage of when you're doing some sort of incremental street processing. Yeah. But in, in terms of just kind of raw data, raw events, both of the, both batch and streaming systems rely on the same exact strategies, which is you do things as fast as you can. And, and beyond that, you're really just parallelizing. How can I get two different processes that are both doing this same kind of job? Yeah. If we get into the details, there's certainly some differences, but for example, in, in our system in flow, we use both logical partitioning physical partitioning when it comes to the actual storage, we have the ability to, to basically take a task the one of these long running stateful stream processing tasks and split it into multiple shards hmm. that can work in parallel. You mentioned briefly about the cost, right? And if I understand this correctly, so basically what it has is like compute storage and network, right? These are the, like the primary pillars of where the cost is coming from, right? So when we compare for some of the workloads, maybe batch processing is just simple and it's not that costly. Let's say you have like very few rows and you just run some job every day that runs for half an hour. It's totally fine. You yeah. don't have to run like a streaming job, for example. But if you have a continuous space of coming data, you want to be real time, maybe streaming is a better solution. Instead of running every hour, some job that takes more processing and all that. But if we talk about general patterns, right? In streaming world, where does this cost opt optimization mainly coming from? Is it storage? Is it network? Is it the compute? So that's a great question. And I would say really the summary answer is that it's, it's primarily coming from lower network utilization and lower storage. Compute is interesting because again, talk about your example of a batch job, a batch job that is running for a half hour each day. And mm -hmm. we're really talking about something very simple. Yeah. have got some batch jobs. They each run on a schedule. They're short. Generally speaking, what you're, what you would do in today's world is you're not going to buy a computer and leave it on for 24 hours a day in order to run that one batch job every mm -hmm. half hour. So yeah. generally your compute cost, you're only paying for that half hour while it's running. Streaming jobs tend to be different. And in the streaming world, generally speaking, most of us would just take each of these stateful jobs that are running as part of your stream processing pipeline, and we're going to leave them running. And that means that you're really paying for that compute kind of the whole time regardless of whether it's doing work or not. Stream processing jobs, some of them, obviously some people have extremely high volume streaming use cases that are just constantly churning through data. And that, that is the thing. But there's also a lot of stream processing jobs that just sit idle most of the time. Mm 
yeah, conceptually you're doing less work because it's incremental, but there's, there is still a little bit of a hump to get over in terms of cost efficiency because you're leaving it running all the time. Yeah. And this is something that it, it really depends on how you're running these things. So for example, in our product, I've invested a lot in being able to pack in these jobs so that we can amortize those costs, hmm. right? We'll have a lot of different stream processing jobs running on one virtual machine and we're able to amortize the, the compute costs, right? If one is doing work, then maybe another is idle and yeah. then it works out that way. But not everybody does that. And I think especially for the kind of the state of the art with streaming systems has been fairly low level lately, right? If you go back and think about running Kafka, even just five years ago, right? There's, there, there's no kind of out of the box solution for that. You just have to, to provision your infrastructure and run things however you run it. And so it could be more costly. If at your company, the best you can do is provision a VM that's running 24 seven and, and, you know, maybe it's only actually doing work for a half hour a day as volume increases, the cost difference really becomes weighted very much in favor of streaming systems mm, just because it's incremental by default. And that simple fact just means you're moving way less data. And so you can tend to pack a lot of these things onto a VM. Yeah. And there's of course no straight answer that, okay, streaming is better for you or batch is better for you. People have to evaluate themselves. Like what is the use yeah. case and do different types of optimizations to save that cost, even with batch or even with streaming, both might work for you, both might not work for you. So you have to evaluate that. And that's a good point as in with any other as you mentioned earlier, anything that you do with computers and engineering, there has to be some trade-off, right? And it's all about making the right choices. I'm curious about, so let's say I, I'm running a company and I'm doing certain data processing. Of course, everyone start at a low scale, right? Not having a lot of customers, not having a lot of data. So I just run like a job that runs every hour or something and I, it's all good. I suddenly become famous and there's a lot of data coming in. I have to scale. So I want to talk a little bit about the mindset that changes here, right? Like the mindset shift. So as an engineer on the team, I have been thinking about my system in terms of batch processing. And then now I have to transition to stream processing, let's say to save cost or to be real time or to just improve the operational stuff that I have to do with the batch processing. Do I have to think about my workloads differently or it's just about changing the underlying platform and then you're good to go? Yeah, I, I think as you're probably in, intuiting, you really do need to treat these things differently. I kind of mentioned before that one of the big differences between these batch jobs and a streaming job is that the streaming job tends to be, it's a very long lived thing. And, and this is conceptually simpler, right? We get this nice, simple graph, yeah. except that each one of these things, it's a stateful job. So that means you've got to manage that somehow, right? It needs that state needs to be durable. That's, it's not a, a trivial thing to do. You got to have, oh, this is one of the things that I think is incredibly, it's just absolutely critical is. Yeah. You have to have good monitoring and observability of mm. these pipelines. It's a long running task. Yeah. And you know, what happens when one of them stops working, mm. you know, that can't be a silent failure. You're, it's not just going to like a lot of times with batch runs, we tend to think, oh, this thing failed. It'll, we'll let the next run, pick it back up and yeah. see how it goes after a restart. And that kind of thing doesn't always work out great in a streaming system. You need to know when things fail, you need to fix it. And so that I think is pretty big. And that's a big part of why I think a lot of people have tended to avoid streaming. The, the, I would say the temperature of the room with regard to streaming, people say, oh yeah, that's great if you need it, but it's 
difficult and costly and easy to screw up. And again, that's really a lot of you're trying to address is to say, let's, let's come up with some conventions, standards, and practices that really work for the majority of use cases. And let's standardize on those. Let's make them ubiquitous. And that can be really good, but yeah, you do need to change your mindset in particular around when the failure scenarios and error handling. I think another big aspect of that is what does it mean to restart a job? Mm-hmm. Again, in, in the batch world, we restart these things all the time, right? Mm-hmm. I, I've been guilty of it myself, you know, restarting a job four times to get it to run. Yeah. And, and in the streaming world, it's, it's not always clear what restarting it even means. Is it restarting with the same state that it had before? Is the state of the job getting reset? What about its outputs? So actually I have another, another slide here that can maybe illustrate some of this a little better because it it adds some more detail. Yeah. And this is an example of how we do this in flow. Hmm. Other streaming systems also do similar things, right? So each of these is a stateful task that is do some amount of work. We call the, we call it a capture when it's pulling in data from an external system. And, and for us, we call it a derivation when it's transforming data or doing aggregates and those kind of things. Yeah. And then the materialization is, is what's pushing it out to a destination. But if you'll notice in between each of these things, we have this collection. Again, that's our word for it. If you're, if you're a Kafka user, right, this is going to be like a Kafka topic, potentially several Kafka topics, but they're conceptually more or less the same thing, right? This is a, it's durable storage for the output of that task. Hmm. So again, what does it mean to restart a derivation? Does that mean that it's going to start reprocessing? all of the historical data from its, from its source collection, or is it, or is it just going to retry processing the last document or something that it saw? Yeah, it is different. We have answers to those questions (laughs) in flow, but I think really the truth is, and part of why this this stuff is pretty complicated is you might have a different answer to that. If, If you've built your streaming platform. You might have a different answer to what does it mean to restart this thing? What does it mean when one of them errors and that kind of thing? Makes sense. That makes sense. And I have restarted so many jobs and I was always scared of the side effects of restarting a job when it is failed in an inconsistent state. So as a developer, I was always curious to how I can just discard the partial state and create a new state for the rerun, right? And that ends up with a lot of reprocessing and that adds a lot of cost and time and to get the final results and so on. Since we are talking about failures, right? Failures are like inevitable. It happens all the time and we have to restart some of the things and retry some of the things. And we typically deal with, let's say in mission critical systems, we have to make sure our systems are right important. And even if we are retrying certain things, the side effect of it is not duplicated or it doesn't impact the customer. Let's say we are talking about a billing pipeline or something and we are not charging the customer twice or we are not showing the usage more than what they actually have. So how is item potency done in batch world as compared to streaming and how does that compare? And with that, I also want to ask you about the exactly ones. It's a semantics. I am fairly... Yeah, comfortable talking about it in the Kafka world. I've worked a little bit there and also a little bit on the Flink side. So maybe you can also give a little bit idea of, of how that works in Flow after giving a little bit of context on general streaming systems. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great one because I think at a high level, I would say that exactly once transactions are essentially, it's a, a hard and fast requirement for streaming. Yeah. If you're talking about a batch system, if you're, say you're doing the, the very kind of the naive batch job of Mm. copying all of the data from the source to the destination, 
there, there are some interesting nuance there and a number of different approaches that people take when it comes to just deciding how do you make that item potent? And again, trade-offs abound, even considering just the happy path for a batch job, right? We're thinking, okay, every day we're going to have a batch job that runs and, and it's going to copy over all the data from the source to the destination. The first most obvious thing we have to deal with is this user's table or in your destination, after that first run, it already has data. Yeah. So what are you doing with it? And there, there's a couple of common approaches for dealing with this. One might just be that you just truncate and recreate the table every time. And that's honestly not terrible for a lot of people. It has some downsides. Probably the biggest one being that, especially if it's a big table and it can take time to, to drop and recreate, mm. then, you know, you, your consumers of that data have downtime. And, and again, with a trivial example of one, one source and one destination table, maybe that's fine. Yeah. But if we're talking about 500 destination tables that are all going down at very getting truncated and recreated at various times throughout the day, that be quickly becomes untenable for an analyst, right? They're not able to make use of that data because it's easily becoming inconsistent. Yeah. So, so what do you do? You, you might do things like make your batch job incremental. So you select only the updated rows and now you're just, you know, inserting or updating your destination. That's great. That, that works until it doesn't. When, you know, when your source table has just a completely different schema, you still have to recreate it there. You can also just create a new user's table every time and suffix it with maybe a date or a, an identifier of which batch run it came from. Yeah. Again, it works, but the downside there is that you really are pushing some complexity onto the consumers of that data. They now have to know which one was the latest successful batch run, which table should I be reading from? Again, there's answers to that. They're not unsolvable problems, but it is complexity yeah. that you have to deal with. In the batch world, failures also, it really depends, I think is the answer. When you talk about item potency, which strategy are you using there? One possibility might be to say, you're going to say, add the data to the destination and give it a new table. And if all the batch runs are successful, maybe I have a view that's just called latest users. And I update that view to point to my new table or something mm. like that. So there's answers for that. I think a big part of, of what I see as the problem here is partial failures of batch jobs. It can be really difficult to identify when you have a job that is working with incomplete data. And so I know we keep coming back to these kind of failure scenarios and item potency, but I think it's really important because to me, the worst possible failure mode here is that you're going to deliver data that is incorrect. With streaming systems, we tend to approach that a little bit differently. So with a streaming system, again, these are our long lived things. And so it forces you to deal with that problem right up front, right? You can't say I have a streaming task and it's just going to run continuously it's never going to go down, right? Mm -hmm. It's not realistic. No, yeah, yeah. there's no way you're going to have hundred percent uptime on any process. Yeah. So the strategies are a little different, but it forces you to deal with that in your streaming platform. And at a high level, that's really the answer is your streaming platform has to be able to deal with that. And your strategies are, you've got transactions which I think are absolutely the, the way to go here. And, and then you've just got other platform facilities for monitoring, restarting, yeah. things like that. As with any process, there is such a thing as, as an unrecoverable failure in a streaming task. Yeah. And so I think that's a big one. So what happens if the Going back to a transform example, right? 
I've realized that my trans, there's a bug in my transform code. Now I've read maybe 90% of the data and, and there was a bug in my transform code. I've produced 90% of my outputs. What do you do? And I think the answer to that again, comes back to you. You've got to have consistency in your platform for how you deal with these things. Yeah. For us, the answer is you create a new collection, right? So you get rid of your old task, you stop it. You're going to say, okay, I'm going to have a new transform that comes in and it's going to start from the beginning. When derivation has a failure, then we need to be able to restart it. If there's a bug in that code, we need to create a new derivation here. And again, that's where I, I don't really have a better answer other than your platform has to give you an answer for how to do yeah. this. And you got to make it pretty easy on yourself, yeah. right? I've, I, I've been coding for a solid 10 years now, and I don't think I've ever written a program without a bug. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. It's, it's very difficult to do. And so iteration is part of the process. Yeah. You've got to do it. You've got to make it easy and have things start to backfill using that, that historical data. So yeah. that means you're retaining that historical data for whatever period is significant to you. That way you can start over from the beginning. Your, again, your platform has exactly once the transactions. This is important because for all of the other failures, right? So if it's a bug in my code, I've produced bad data or something like that. There's just nothing much else to be done other than starting it over. Yeah. There are mm -hmm. lots of other reasons why something might fail, yeah. right? And for those, I think the transactions is really the way to go. Some people might be thinking, why don't you, why don't you use item potency instead? Mm. And certainly technically on some level, that's always kind of part of the process, but, but I do want to address the idea of saying some people might be tempted to say, I'm going to add an item potency key to every document. And I'm just going to have every consumer check that and see if they've processed it to get processed it before. And if not, then process it again. And I think the risk here is really that you're forcing that complexity into all of your consumers. And the risk is when you get that wrong, it can be really bad. Yeah. Right. You're getting bad data that's leaking to basically everything downstream. And that can be pretty tough. You're also, you're introducing additional state that everything has to work with. If you still think, yeah, but we could do it right. Consider problems like, like where you have a derivation that is reading from multiple sources, right? Item potent processing of that source data becomes a much more complex question when you consider that there you're reading from multiple sources. Now, what happens if you process something in a different order? which is something that, you know, can happen, right? Like ordering in any kind of distributed system is extremely complex. Yeah. yeah I think not to beat a dead horse, but that transactions are, are really important for this to, to all work. You really don't want to process a streaming event more than once. You uh, you will absolutely get bad data if you do. Yeah, absolutely. I would love my platform to give it to me for free. I don't want to implement item potency on top of <laughs> every stream processing that I do because it is, it's so complex and it's not just about implementing it once and forgetting, right? Because it's, right. we evolve the software, we evolve our pipelines and things may go wrong. And as you said, you and I haven't written any program without bugs, right? Like the first version is of course buggy. It's meant to be buggy because that's how you build software, right? There are things missing. You don't want to be perfect. So I love having these inbuilt functionalities in, in my platform. And that's the way to go. Before we summarize what we have discussed so far, comparing batch and real-time systems, I want to talk a little bit about the another very important topic, which is the schema evolution, right? Like we deal with data, there's schema attached to data. Even if you use like schema-less database, there's some schema at your application layer, right? So there's always some schema and you have to add new features, you have to add new fields and whatnot. 
sometimes you may have to make backward incompatible changes some sometimes it's compatible and it's a mess right dealing with a lot of schema evolution how does that compare with batch processing and stream processing is it easier in stream or is it easier in the old batch systems yeah and i think at a high level i would say that it's maybe not easier or harder in either one yeah but it is definitely different mm-hmm. to go back to this example of we have uh, we have this table over here and we're going to copy it over every time and i think a like a really good example and this happens all the time right you're and for context here i think a lot of times we don't always appreciate the kind of the essential complexity of data engineering yeah. and what we're trying to do here because we're really trying to bridge two different worlds uh, a lot of times where we're trying to bridge between on the left we have an operational system oftentimes it's been it's built by developers for a very different purpose in mind than what you're doing with their their data yeah this may be again a web app it could be an iot device it could be who knows what that's producing data all of our systems yeah. produce data yeah. and we as developers of those systems we tend to treat analytical value of that data as an afterthought and and i'm not judging that or saying people are necessarily even wrong to to approach it that way but that's where we're starting that's our sources and our destination is really oftentimes people who want to make decisions about the business what do we do next how do we need to adjust our pricing do we need to do x y or z and they have very different needs that could be very difficult but one of the things that happens is there there's this kind of decoupled set of concerns and the common scenario is your application developers say you know what we need to run a database migration and we're completely changing the shape of this table so a good e- example here might be you know what we've used sequential ids for our users and that's actually really not great from a security perspective now we have guessable user ids and and that's yeah, causing other problems so we're going to run a huge migration and we're going to go to using uids for our user ids yeah. your users table in the warehouse i think one thing that it that it really is kind of this impacts both batch and streaming systems is that if your pipeline is incremental you you've got a very different sort of breakage here it's in a in an incremental pipeline where you're trying to do this you can't do this if they've just run a migration and completely changed the shape of that table yeah you need to start from the beginning you need to reset your last sync time you need to update the schema of the table in your destination and recreating that whole thing end to end is your answer here right and again that's really our approach to this kind of scenario where there's just a complete completely incompatible schema change yeah in flow we say you know what you're going to recreate everything downstream of that start it over from the beginning yeah and we're we have some tools to make that make that process easy going back to the batch world though the batch world if you're not doing this if you're not doing this incrementally sometimes that naive approach just works out right yeah. so you might have a a job that's just taking all of the data from the source to the destination and say you're creating a new users table every time and it's suffixed with a date of the run that schema might be totally different and from the perspective of a data engineer you're fine right yeah. my job was to move this from the source to the data warehouse let's go <laughs> schema evolution's no problem in our system yeah of course the reality is that for a consumer of that data the, there's still a problem if we step back and really look at end to end how is this process working it's still very much a problem because you know that consumer of that data is going to say users version 1 users version 2 version 3 so on and so forth all of a sudden in version 7 the schema is totally different 
now we have to change what we're doing and, and it's difficult to communicate that for that reason. I think in terms of like best practices, the ideal for, for a consumer of that data is to say that let's do things incrementally until the schema changes in a, some sort of fundamentally incompatible way. Yeah. What's interesting about that is that it, the benefit of that, just to be clear, is that now users get this much simpler conceptual model where they say, okay, I have a user's table that I can query and it's kept up to date incrementally. I don't need to worry about that. And when the table changes, I can assume that the schema might have changed. That, that kind of works out pretty well. The, the other thing you have to deal with though, is there's also a lot of schema evolution that is compatible. And an example would be something like, maybe we're just adding a column on a kind of a go forward basis, or maybe we're saying, you know what, this column used to be not null. Now we're going to allow nulls or something like that. Those kind of things, certainly from, from a user's perspective, shouldn't be a big deal, right? Yeah. We should be able to do that. And that's in, in flow. That's certainly how we, we do it. It's, you know, those kind of very, I'll say trivial or easy schema changes can just plumb through and it's no problem. But I think it's worth pointing out that there's not always a clear answer to what is and is not a breaking schema change. And this is true as true of streaming systems as it is of batch, yeah. right? I see a new column that shows up. Well, do I need to go restart my backfill to grab historical data from that column? Or is this only added on a go forward basis? Yeah. It, there, it's very difficult to programmatically determine whether that's the case and, and handle that thing automatically. So I think there's always a user in the loop. And from my perspective, the user always has to have that, that say of, is this data compatible? Is this supposed to work? And, and if so, yeah, great. We'll modify the schema on a go forward basis. And if not yeah. restart, you get a new table. Makes sense. That makes sense. And I've been part of many schema migrations and most of them were compatible. Like we just add another optional field or something like that. And it was still okay. But yeah, we have to do backfills and make sure backfill is done and it's correct and all that. But yeah, I think just to summarize what we have discussed so far, to give our viewers some kind of thumb rules, like to decide on their journey of data processing when they deal with batch processing and real-time streaming applications. I think in my experience and in my opinion, I think for most cases, we are going to need both paradigms. We just have to play well with both of these and make our decisions, make good judgments when it comes to deciding which one to use. And I have seen like streaming use cases working very well with batch processing. Let's say I have a streaming pipeline that works really well for the critical path. It's all doing well, but when things go wrong and when I want to ensure that everything is perfect, I have these reconciliation jobs that run and make sure the state change was correct, the aggregation was fine, there's no discrepancy and all that. So I see these two paradigms coming together and giving you a very nice balance of the cost savings and correctness and simplicity and easy to manage systems and all that. And I think we have covered nicely some of the key points that one should think about when they are comparing these systems. And maybe it's not like comparison feels like you have to choose one, but that's not ideally the case. You can choose both. It's just that where you apply that, that kind of paradigm is the problem. So I think if you, if you want to add something to give our viewers like thumb rules, please feel free to do that. But I think we have covered really key points in both these systems. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I I think what you said is absolutely spot on. And, and that's really going back to the genesis for us in building flow as our approach from day one was always that regardless of where your data is, we need to meet you there. We, we go to the data and, you know, we never wanted it to be the kind of thing where users are forced into that ecosystem. There's no lock in and things like that. It's really about being able to work with data 
wherever it is and regardless of how it got there. And I think you're absolutely right that in the real world, there's, there, there's not, there's not any reality where somebody says, oh no, we're fully a streaming shop and everything, every bit of data in our, in our whole system is going through this streaming system and that's it. Yeah. Um, it's just not realistic. So I, I think people do need to use whatever kind of makes sense for them in their context. I think the basic guideline is that if you've got, so again, the basic difference between batch and streaming is batch can be incremental. Streaming is generally always incremental and streaming can be real time and, and oftentimes is. And so it basically, it comes down to, do you need it to be incremental yeah. and what are your latency requirements? Again, like the incremental thing largely comes down to, I, from my perspective, cost, that's, that, that's what really is the differentiator for a lot of people. If you've got a lot of data dealing with it incrementally is way cheaper. We're talking <laughs> for some data sets and it's orders of magnitude cheaper mm. and also for latency, right? If you want a dashboard that has data that is within minutes or seconds, you don't really have an option, right? And your data is going to, that dashboard is going to be, it's going to be really reflect the freshness of the slowest data pipeline. Yeah. Yeah. I think those are largely it. I do anticipate, and I certainly hope that streaming is going to really catch on a lot more as it yeah. becomes easier to use, as you have more options and things, platforms that can handle a lot of the complexity for you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think this session has been really useful. I recollected a lot of memories from my batch processing experience and streaming experience and all the horror stories maintaining those systems and being correct. So definitely... I am totally up for any platform that supports all these and makes my job easy as a developer. And yeah, I'm really thankful that we discussed this today and helped me also clarify a lot more things and building a new perspective to look at these both these paradigms. Thanks, Phil. It was really nice talking to you. And I'm really hoping that our viewers will also like this episode and learn from it and at least understand the key differences and how they can work well together. And yeah, so thanks a lot for joining the show today. And for our viewers, if you like this episode, please hit the like button, share it with your network, whoever is working with a lot of data. It's really important for them to understand these differences and these nuances. And also subscribe to the channel. Also, please feel free to look at uh, Asturi and what they're doing, Flow, this amazing product. And yeah, feel free to reach out if you have any questions to me or to Phil. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.